Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Terry Gilman, and I'm the owner of Creating Conversations. And I want to welcome you to the fifth program in a series that we have called Creating Conversations with Literary Women. I also do want to just take a second to tell you how much I appreciate your attendance tonight and your book purchases, and not just tonight, but for all of the previous programs. Um, you have helped to sustain our independent business over the last 15 months, so thank you very much. Tonight, Pam Atherton will be in conversation with Paulette Giles, and they will be talking about her latest novel, Simon the Fiddler, which has just been released in paperback. The series is made possible because of the support and partnership between Creating Conversations and Literary Women. Barbara Wild, who is the Chair of Literary Women, will now introduce our guests. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for giving us the honor of spending some time with us. As Terry said, I'm Barbara Wild, Chair of Literary Women, where our mission is to celebrate women authors, contemporary women authors, by providing a platform for them to speak. And usually this means we put on an in-person festival of authors. Of course, you know that lately, almost everybody has had to go virtual with their events. Um, so we're happy tonight that we're in collaboration with Creating Conversations who is our favorite independent bookstore and festival book provider. I'm sure you've met them if you've come to our festivals. Um, and just an announcement, I don't know if I said this, we will be doing our festival next year on March 19th. First, I'd like to um, take care of some thank yous. Um, one big one goes to the Port of Long Beach for their help in supporting our Emerging Writers Program, honoring young writers of talent. Also a big thanks to the City of Long Beach and the Arts Council who have shown us their generosity by way of grants to support our virtual events such as the one you're in tonight and helps us reach our audience. Now I'd like to introduce our guide for the rest of the hour. Uh, we'll be in the very capable hands of Pam Atherton who is a media coach, a professional interviewer, a seminar leader, a keynote speaker, and a whole host of other talents. And they make her the best at what she does. We'd like to thank her for her commitment. She must like us or something. She keeps doing this and we're very, very grateful. Tonight, she engages our supremely talented author Paulette Giles in conversation. And Pam, I'm going to let you take it away. Hi, Paulette. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Happy to be here. Before we start, I've got a little bit of housekeeping to take care of. First of all, I want to say thank you to Creating Conversations and to literary women who have created a new way of having conversations, and that is virtually. And that allows us to bring authors in that we might not otherwise have a way to do and sustained us through the pandemic. Housekeeping here. Feel free to make comments in the chat box. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. That's also where you'll find links that will allow you to uh, find out more about Paulette, to find out more about creating conversations and about literary women, and how to get the book if you, or, or books, I should say, if you don't already have them. We will have questions at the end from the audience. There is a section down at the bottom again, right next to the chat, that's called Q&A. That's where the questions will go. We won't be taking any from the chat. We'll only be taking them from the Q&A. We won't be using the raise hand function. So just the chat for you to chat amongst yourselves or to get information about the program tonight and the Q&A for you to write your questions. And you can write your questions starting now. Um, they'll be cal put all together and then we will uh, take care of that towards the end of the program. Okay, so next, uh, if you don't have a book, Terry will be happy to get you a, a copy of the book. The link will be in the uh, chat. 
You'll get an email after the event that will um, tell you more about it. Thank you for coming and give you information about all of the people who are involved here tonight. Now this is a live event, so there may be dogs barking and cats walking across the keyboard and garbage trucks, who knows? It's live, enjoy it, it's gonna be fun. Tonight, we look forward to having a great conversation with Paulette Giles. And of course, we're gonna have a lot of laughs as well. She's a poet, a best-selling author, a musician, and so much more. Paulette wrote the astonishing News of the World and Simon the Fiddler, and she's a woman full of surprises. Did you know she speaks Ojibwe? You do now. We might even get her to say a couple of words in that as well. That she spent almost a decade helping the indigenous people in, the, in North Ontario, uh, Ontario and the Arctic to create radio stations, low power radio stations for them to share their language and their events. Paulette has taken home Canada's highest award for poetry, the Governor General's Award, poetry which has been called philosophical, ironic, and witty. When she turned to writing novels, her 2002 novel, The Enemy Woman, won Canada's Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize and America's Willa Cather Award for historical fiction. Her novel, News of the World, of course, was a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction, and you may have seen the movie that came out at Christmas of 2020. It was also named one of the 10 best books of 2016 by the Washington Post. But lest you think she spends all of her time writing, she also think, sings in a choir, play, uh, sings cantatas, and plays the tin whistle for the group picking on the porch. Not to mention all the effort that it takes to run a working ranchito with horses and donkeys. Simon the Fiddler is her seventh book and a series of books that includes, here's my favorite, okay? Her 1986 Sitting in the Club Car, Drinking Rum and Karma Cola, a detective fiction and chase movie spoof Somebody please, Terry, get me that book because I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading that one, okay? It's my favorite. So we are honored and thrilled to have her with us today. Paulette Giles, thank you so much for being with us. You're very welcome and, and uh, congratulations to the group, um, the Literary Women of Long Beach. They have really hung in through this COVID thing and they're doing great and I am really honored to talk to them. Very energetic and, and uh, book loving women and, and I really appreciate being asked. Well, it's great and we hope to see you out here soon for their festival, which they will be having again this coming year. So that's exciting. You know, um, so this series, the, the news of the world, Simon the Fiddler are kind of intertwined. And I know for me, I sometimes am sad at the end of a book because the characters are gone and I'm never gonna see them again, which is kind of why I'm a fan of detective novels that you can you know, yeah. keep seeing the characters over and over again. I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, but you kind of did that for us with News of the World and, and Simon the Fiddler, did you know when you wrote News of the World that you were going to weave this tapestry? Um, well, it was the same thing. See, um, Captain Kidd, Captain uh, Jefferson Kyle Kidd actually showed up in an earlier novel called The Color of Lightning, which is about, about a a true life person. The only, the only novel I've written, ever written about a real person, um, Rich Johnson, who is an African-American frontiersman. And he showed up in that novel at a point where I needed uh, the readership to, I needed to do an information dump, as it were. It, <laughs> it wasn't a huge dump, but um, the, the readership needed to be told about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment just being passed. And uh, I had friends who actually, his great grandfather actually did that. His name was Captain Kidd. And he went from town to town reading newspapers and saw, oh, what a great character. I'll put him in this book, have him read the news and Britt Johnson and his crew, his, uh, his freighting crew will be there and he will hear them read it. And that's how we get the news to Britt and to the audience, to the readership. Um, but um, he was just too good a character to pass up. I, and I thought he needs his own novel. So he showed up in his own novel. And by that time, Simon the Fiddler and I was playing with this group. We have a terrific fiddler, Tom Bomer. He's just a knockout country fiddler. And I thought, you know, I need a fiddler in this book. And so Simon showed up 
in the book because Captain Kidd needed somebody to take care of the girl while he went and did his reading. Okay. So I thought, well, Simon <laughs> deserves his own book too. And so it's like nesting Russian dolls, you know, one inside the other, one inside the other. I keep finding characters um, whose paths cross and uh, they show up in one another's books. So. And, and I, is, do you have one that you're working on that's going to come from Simon the Fiddler? Yeah. Yes. And that would be? Pardon? And that would be? That would be, well, this one's kind of a murder mystery. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Well, we're going to come back to that because I, I, okay. I want to know more about that and who you're going to take where and, and things like that. Oh. Um, but I want, you know, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm notorious for giving away spoilers. So I don't want to give a summary of Simon the Fiddler. I want you to, because I know you'll be very careful not to give too much away. Well, um, partially it's, it's kind of a buddy story. Um, working with this musical group has been just a thrill and I'm, they put up with me and I'm, I'm so grateful that they do. And we do mainly kind of roots music and we've, we've worked together and sung together and, and played together for a long time. We've been about seven years and we've got to where all it takes is a glance, you know, for somebody to say, you, you take it now, you take the bridge or, you know, are you going to sing this or, you know, you're off, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, and so I wanted that kind of camaraderie when Simon tries to, at the end of the Civil War, He's drafted, the conscription then grabbed Simon the Fiddler. He's been trying to avoid them all through the Civil War, but they grab him. He ends up in a battle, and uh, the last battle of the Civil War, Los Palmitos down near Matamoros on the Mexican border was the last battle of the Civil War. And um, then after the surrender, he and, and this group of musicians uh, kind of bond together and say, okay, let's make a living. They're starving, everybody's starving. Everybody was starving in Texas at the time. There were no railroads. Uh, stuff was blown up. Uh, the, uh, there was hardly any, they went back to the barter system. There was no um, money that was worth anything. The banks had failed. Um, and so they just made their way from town to town, you know, playing. And so each one of the guys in the group um, has a distinct personality and um, then Simon falls absolutely in love with a beautiful young Irish indentured servant uh, who has come over to work for a colonel who is a very bad man and he's determined to rescue her and he's determined to keep playing his music and he gets himself in all kinds of interesting trouble and so I won't go on and say anything. Yeah, because we, we don't want to give too much away but you know if you happen to have already read News of the World well, then we already gave too much away. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in, in looking at News of the World, in looking at Simon the Fiddler, obviously there was scads of research that you had to do. So how much research did you do? How did you go about it? You know, what did you look at? Well, I had always done, already done an enormous amount of research for um, Brit John, the book on Britt Johnson, which is called The Color of Lightning into the Plains Indian tribes. The, the, the native people that I worked with were a forest, northern, subarctic people, and they were very different from the Plains tribes. And so I had to do research on that. I had to do research on the Kiowa language, which I had never run into before. It's a tonal language, it's tonal, like Chinese is tonal and Vietnamese is tonal. Uh, Kiowa is one of the few Native American languages which has tones. And, um, and so, but I had already done an immense amount of research, so I really didn't have to do that much when it came to uh, Captain Kidd uh, and News of the World. Uh, what I did have to do was I had to research newspaper articles from the 1870s and make sure they were 1870 and not 1871. Um, and find interesting things for him to read. Uh, I had to do research on what kind of American coins fit inside a shotgun shell. And uh, then I had, um, but that was about it. I had done an enormous amount of research for Color of Lightning, Cooper Johnson. So what is, it was what, what's your favorite running. part of doing research? Um, oh, you can just, you can wander off down very strange paths and you have to tell yourself, stop, you're not going to use this. You're just doing it because it's interesting. And 
so yeah and, and and part of the best part is traveling to the place where the action takes place and trying to imagine what it might have looked like in 1870 because the world has changed very much um and and hiking through the wichita mountains um did the, i did the circle tour with a friend um that and, and that's very much in the color of lightning and with um and then research down in Casterville with the German uh, with German American community down there. They were very welcoming, very nice people. They took me everywhere, uh, and I had wonderful German food. <laughs> um, and but but it wasn't as hard as it was for Color of Light. It's Color of Light. And I started out on Ground Zero. What has been the most exciting or thrilling thing that you have found in your research? Oh golly. I don't know. Just now, I am researching the very, very old French uh, communities of Missouri. I'm related to those people. Um, South St. Louis was originally a, a French town, and St. Genevieve, which is, should be pronounced St. Genevieve, um, and uh, Bourbon and Bonterre and uh, Marie de Seigne and people don't even realize now that they existed, although it's coming back a little bit. And, and the discovery through a wonderful book about the old French communal land system and, and how it was destroyed by the American land laws, which destroyed those communities. Um, they hung on for a while. That was a great discovery for me. I, I've you know, been back and forth through those communities ever since I was a little kid, but I didn't realize that they were founded on, on a common field and the, uh, they had a huge common where all the animals were put together and the villages themselves are very compact. It, it was a whole of the world that was destroyed, unfortunately. I feel lucky to be related to them. And that was my latest discovery. How, how the common field system worked was beautiful. I think there's so much in our history that, that we didn't study in schools and that we are just maybe now finding out about, um, you know, that if, for example, you take the Tulsa massacre, you know, you, you mentioned it about a year ago in your blog, you obviously are very aware of it, but it's just now coming into the consciousness. And there's so much to our history, like you're digging up what you just talked about that we never learned about. And, no, and that's gotta be exciting. Yeah. Yeah, people tend to fall into cliches, you know, like the West all looks like Monument Valley, all cowboys look like John Wayne. It's people just um, thinking cliches quite a lot. But the, the country is so diverse and has so many strange, interesting facts and corners. And so I, that's what I love to dig out. <laughs> go through, go down a lot of rabbit holes, right? Ooh, a lot of rabbit holes, yes. Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the things I saw in a lot of the reviews of not just, you know, professional reviewers, but of um, readers as well, is the talk about how you actually put us in that dusty country place where we are, and how we feel it, we sense it, we smell it, you know, we're all involved in it. When you write, do you do that? Do you immerse yourself in that? Well, yes, I guess I'm fortunate. In fact, I, I'm very fortunate to have come from a very old traditional Ozark home. And my people were musical people. They sang, we sang at home, just as a matter of course. I thought everybody sings at home. We sang together in harmony when we were doing the dishes and when we were traveling in the car. And, and I loved staying with my grandparents. They had a wood stove, they had kerosene lamps for light. They milked their own cows. And we stayed with them for you know a month at a time. It was just a wonderful experience. Um, and they told stories, and my grandfather could sing all twenty-five verses of the Fox and the Goose, and um, and I was very lucky to have that. And and that's part of the nineteenth century, and that's why I can evoke that and the smells. There's always a smell of wood smoke in a home. 
when you don't have central heating, when you're using a wood stove or a fireplace, so I thought, why is this the slightest to the, the smell of wood smoke, which smells wonderful to me, absolutely wonderful. And, and how things operate, like those kerosene lanterns have to be cleaned because they get smoky and um, wood has to be brought in and it has to be brought in in the middle of the night sometimes. And the chimney whistles uh, very strangely during storms and the whippoorwill uh, my grandmother used to put us to sleep by saying, you've got to count now from the whippoorwill how long he goes, and because he's going to go to 125, then he's going to stop. But of course, we were dead asleep by the time we got to 50. And so these, um, these are things that, and it, it, my advice to any young author who wants to write historical fiction is to go on a two-week camping trip to learn what it is to not reach for a switch and turn on light or heat uh, or, or have running water and have to build a fire to stay warm. And if they could experience that for two weeks and, and keep it in mind when they're writing, that's what the 19th century is like. So I guess I, guess I was just fortunate. Well, I think there is, um, it, it's the small things, the little things, the cleaning of the kerosene lamp that actually transports us to that time. And you know, the sign of a good book is if we're transported. And that's what you absolutely do to us, is you transport us to that time. It, knowing that all of these are intertwined. So I have to ask, I mean, you know, News of the World became a movie. Tom Hanks, you know, wanted to do this book. How did you feel? I felt great. I mean, he's, he's, he's such a, a protean actor. He, he can take on almost any role and make it work. And, and so I was very confident. I was, I was relieved. I was enormously relieved because I knew they were going to make a movie of it. And I was very worried about who would take that role. And when I heard it was him, I mean, he's just such an accomplished actor. He's one of the best there is. And so I knew he would do a great job, but he did. Well, and, and you know, he this is his first Western. He chose your book to be his first Western, which I think is pretty remarkable. It's and very um, and the, the man who was the director, Paul Greengrass, uh, He's famous for doing the Bourne movies, right? Something totally right. opposite from this. Well, there's a lot of action in those movies. Yes. So. Yeah, well, that's true. There is a lot of action in your movie. But here's something he said. Uh, he said, I wanted to make a film on those themes of healing and redemption. I loved the book and it seemed to speak to today. So that theme of this book transports time. It's not just a story about the 1860s. It's about today and, and healing and redemption. I mean, that's, I think, uh, a pretty strong endorsement, you know, of your book. And he was thrilled too. Did you speak with him? Oh, yes. Yeah. And how about Tom? Did you get a chance Pardon? to speak with, did you get a chance to speak with Tom Hello? as well? I did, I did, he spoke on the phone. And no, were they- I don't repeat conversations, so. <laughs> It was wonderful. It was wonderful to speak to both of them. Um, they were very kind. And uh, Tom F Hanks is very funny. He's a very funny guy. He's a terrific comic. And he, he had me laughing. And uh, Paul Greengrass is just a uh, very uh, deeply informed and intelligent man. And it's wonderful to speak to him. And they made a, for those who have not seen the movie, I highly suggest you see it. It's not the same as the book there, obviously, because it's you know, a short format, they have to take out a lot of things. But I think they did justice to the most important part of your book. And I think the, the girl who plays Johanna in the movie is, I mean, she's what I had in my head. I thought she was fabulous. She was terrific, Helen Zemler. And I, I was told by the producer that when she was just trying out for that part, she wanted the part and, and her mother did too, uh, that she had learned Kiowa before she even, uh, in order to audition, so wow. learn phrases of Kiowa in order to, you know. So she was determined to get it. She was terrific. She was really yeah. funny and she was sad and, and she was the perfect person. Yeah, she really fit it well. So, of course, the next question is is this now also going to be a possibility for Simon the Fiddler? I don't know. You know, I do my job as an author and the, my agents do their job. And so I just have to sit back and wait and, and they will tell me. They have, of course, sent it out with uh, a CD. They, they sent out the manuscript to various producers and also a CD with um, several of the 
songs that are named in in Song of the Fiddler. And those songs are, those songs were hard to research, I'm telling you, because so many of the traditional fiddle tunes, you can look it up on YouTube or you can look it up anywhere and it says traditional fiddle tune. And then you go someplace else and it says it was written in 1890. And I'm looking for Civil War era or before, 1864. And so I had to be really, really careful. And they change names. They, they're like, they're protean. They, they switch and change names and change form a little bit. I don't know if you know of um, Doc Watson. Have you ever heard of Doc Watson? He's a very, very famous um, bluegrass guitarist. I think he's passed away now. He's blind, blind from birth. Uh, you never heard of Doc Watson? At any rate, Doc Watson is very famous for hitting 77 notes in 11 seconds in a song called Black Mountain Rag. I love Black Mountain Rag. And I looked it up and it said it came from a tune called The Lost Child. Now that sounds very sad and mournful, but when you listen to The Lost Child, it's almost identical to Black Mountain Rag, which is a hard, fast, very driving tune. And this happened with so many songs and it was so much fun to try to run them back like Wayfaring Stranger goes back to an old, old song called The Tennessee Wagoner. And so it was like stepping back into folk time, which is different than official time. <laughs> it was like doing genealogy on the music, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I knew who the parent song was of this parent song. and Right. Right. No, so you not. ask somebody, do you know the tune Red Hair? You ask a fiddler, a country fiddler, do you know the tune Red Haired Boy? And and he said, well, sing part of it. And so you do some humming. He says, no, no, that's that's Mississippi Sawyer. Or that's another, he knows it by another name. And that's what I love about these country fiddle tunes. They were passed down without ever being written down. And who knows how far back in time they come from. I, I just love that. They're, they're like, they're not fossils because they're living and, and alive and, and bright and delightful, but they they have their own roots that are not that have not been interfered with. They've sort of organically happened. So. And people love that uh, part of the book, the fact that music is almost a character. I mean, number one, it's so important. Oh, that's a good title. idea. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, and I mean, I just, you know, some of the things people said, the New York Times, the reader is treated to an alchemy on the page where character setting and song converge all at the right notes. I mean, that's beautiful. Um, another reviewer says, music is an important theme throughout Simon the Fiddler. Uh, Publishers Weekly, Giles immerses the reader in the sensory details of the era with special emphasis on the demands and rewards of a ragtag Texas fiddle band. I mean, that's, that's critical. And, and the fun part, this, and I'm gonna share a secret here, Paulette, okay? The fun part is your characters, one plays the fiddle, one plays the guitar, one of them uh, plays the, the, the tin whistle, the penny whistle. The tin whistle, that's Damon. Yes, and my understanding is you do as well. I do as well, that's Do right. you happen to have one handy? I do, I, I, I uh... The tin, the tin whistle, I could go on. I researched tin whistles as well. And um, they go back to, who knows how ancient they are. I mean, there are, there are whistle because they're played straight down and a flute is played this way across. And a whistle, any kind of whistle is played straight down. And these go back probably 30,000 years because in some ancient cave in Germany, they found a vulture's wing bone that had six holes in it, just like this. And uh, you can see it on YouTube, it's the most amazing thing. They did a, an exact reproduction of it, of this vulture's wing bone with the six holes. And the, anthropo uh, the archeologist picked it up and played, played stars and stripes forever on it. <laughs> Da, 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 and on that ancient 30,000 year old flute. And he played it across, I think he was playing. So would you, do you want a tune or what? It's yeah, I would like a little something, but I also want to ask you quickly, is a tin whistle and a penny whistle the same thing? Yes, they are. Okay, and yeah. this is the part that uh, was surprised to me. They are different keys. So like there's a G penny whistle and a C penny whistle. That's so right. which one will you play? 
this is my big G and that's in the book, Simon the Fiddler, because this one will wear you out. You're moving air down this huge bore and if you play it for too long, you start, you run out of breath and start seeing the stars, which happens to Damon. <laughs> they, they're supposed to lead the troops into the surrender and he's tootling away there. And, and Simon's head is fiddled slowly. But these are so-called primitive instruments. You cannot play more than a, one um, key, one octave on them. So you have to have a different pipe for every key. So that's my big G. And this is an A. And it's, uh, this is a C. We're getting smaller and smaller here. This is a C. And, and they're not made of, and this is my D. And they're not made of, um, metal anymore they're, they're they're not made of tin anymore they're, these are carbon fiber so um they uh Is called a slip jig. Now, did and, you did you learn um, the penny whistle before you wrote these books? Yeah, I I had been struggling. Well, I the, this group asked me to play with them because I can do harmony really well. I don't have a strong voice at all. I don't have a great voice, but I can hit the note and I can do harmony. So I, I sing alto, and so they asked me, and I had a guitar, but as I've gotten older, my fingers have stiffened up terribly, and I simply could not exert the pressure to get the strings down on my guitar and get a note. So I thought, I've got to give it up. And I, what am I going to do? So I decided to start playing a penny whistle. And so my fingers work perfectly well on these things. So um, now with us coming back into doing uh, events, will you be performing? Uh, doing which event? Well, now that, that we're coming back to doing events after COVID, will your group, Picking on the Porch, be doing some events? Oh, we've been doing them all along. Yeah, we do. Uh, a lot of times we do funerals, which are very, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be asked to play at a funeral. I usually play a kind of Irish lament uh, along with other songs with group. And uh, those have been some great experiences in my life. And birthday parties and weddings, and we play at church, and we do hard rock gospel. And tomorrow night, no, Saturday night, we're playing at a drive-in theater. <laughs> yeah, they, we've been out, it's not really a drive-in theater. They just put up a big outdoor screen and sure. everybody comes and brings popcorn. And so we're, we're playing there. We'll, we'll do a lot of bluegrass. That's, that's how much- So fun. we've been, yeah, we've been doing events all along. Yeah. People need music. They, they you know, uh, we're looking back at a time in Simon the Fiddler when nobody heard music unless they were in the presence of the performer. But now the, the performer and the music has become separated. And so people right. can consume music all day long uh, without knowing anything about the performer, without seeing them, without being in their presence. This is a very different thing to be there in front of them and when they're playing. And so uh, anyway, I'm, I'm just delighted to be part of this. They put up with me. They put up with me. <laughs> well, but I know another secret now too. Um, we know that the uh, the book is available as a paperback, as a hardback, and it's available as an audiobook. And you have something to do with that audiobook. We did. You know, um, I forget this wonderful person's name at Harper Collins, but she was in charge of doing it. I wish I could remember her name because she needs credit and praise. And she said, "Can you get your group together and find a recording studio and do the intro and the outro?" And so we did, it was about 40 miles away. And we went and had lunch and had wine, drank wine and, and went to the recording studio and recorded the intro, uh, Jocko Hazeline and uh, Red Hair Boy. And we did, in the middle, I did uh, Red River Valley with Tom and Fiddle and me on the sea whistle. And at the end, we came out with Mississippi Sawyer. He ended it with Mississippi Sawyer. So if you do buy the audio book and maybe even buy it as well as the paper book, or the that's hard us. Book. That's them. Yeah, you you have the author. Same. 
right there playing for you. I think that's fabulous. How, what a wonderful thing to be able to have to say, you know, you know, that's Paulette playing the whistle on that. Oh, you know? it, it was so much fun. It was just, we just had a great time. You know? Tess Gerritsen, by the way, plays on one of her books. There's a, a book about a symphony that was created and she played in that. I thought that was just- What does she play? Uh, she, I think she plays uh, violin uh, or, and piano, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, she was uh, the whole, it was a symphony that she actually, I think, wrote for one of her books. And, and so it's always special to have the author involved in a way that you, that's unexpected. We know that you're is right. terrific. I'm glad somebody else has done this one. Yeah, well, um, you know who else did was uh, Jeffrey Deaver. He's a, 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 po a, a writer as well of folk tunes, and he wrote folk tunes for one of his books. So it's very cool that we get to see you, the author, in a different way, that you're not just sitting in your, your attic or wherever you are writing. Right. <laughs> anyway, right. You're a real person. Right. <laughs> Well, you know, I've always said that um, writing is the only art in which there is no central input whatsoever. Um, it's all language. And if you, you can't play a tune, you have to describe a tune. You can't um, paint a sunset. You have to describe the colors of the sunset. It's very um, removed in that sense. Um, with, you know, all of the other arts, all of them, the, collaborative arts, the, the singular arts, um, there's some central input, but with writing, there's not, it's the only one. And it's, it's, so this is very necessary to mental health, I guess you could say. Well, and not only do you have to make us hear the music and see the painting and feel the emotions, but often in a very good book, you are led somewhere um, emotionally. And with your books and, and you know, at least in this series for sure. And I think actually probably in all of them, although I haven't read the one about Carmicola and I'm serious, I want that book. <laughs> but um, one of the things that they said, and I'll again quote other people in this, uh, reviewers and readers alike, you know, saying things like Giles' novels comes to a hopeful conclusions. Um, it's hopeful, the thread of the, the whole book is that it's a very hopeful um, that you lead to optimism. So, um, and I'm sorry, but my computer uh, wants to shut down and I don't want it to. <laughs> um, but you are, you lead us with understanding resiliency and hopefulness and that things can and will be better. And that is a, um, a major theme of your books. When you were writing did you realize that is how your readers would be affected? No, but um, you see, one thing that's very important to me is for people to understand that a story is a story. And it, it doesn't particularly, people are often seeking to find where the books are relevant to, today, to, today, to today's social or economic or political situation. But stories are like folk tunes. They're like they have their own organic life, separate from our our society. And and um, and they're almost always they almost always end in a hopeful and cheerful note. And it seems to be part part of the very structure. Um, to, to, it's become very fashionable to have depressing endings and depressing people who make bad choices in life and so forth and so on. It's very much a fashion and it's become very rigid in, in its fashionableness. But the closer I get to a folk tale, the happier I am because it has the folk tale, like folk tunes, have their own independent life and they seem to be almost independent of us in some way. And when you look back, like I say, of the cave paintings and that ancient Bourbon flute, you realize it hasn't changed. You know, the, the fact of these ancient folk tunes and these ancient stories, they haven't changed. They're with us still. And they're a great resource to go back to, to get out of misery. <laughs> But, you know, how the story is told can make a difference. You know, they, the stories may be, you know, as old as time, 
uh, to quote Disney, but um, you know, there is, there's something about the way it's told. And I'll give you an example for me. It was like on page four, I think it was, when you were explaining about the man who was going to hide Simon in the ice house. And you were saying that he was a, you know, just like those coastal southerners, he was dropping R's like loose buttons. And I mean, I just, I, I, I was like, oh, now I know how he talks. You know, that was one of my favorite lines. Another one, and, and this one I think has a future, okay, was the line where it was says it was all he had against a chaotic world and the mindlessness of a losing war against corruption, thievery, cowardice, incompetence, cactus, gun smoke, and hominy. And I said to myself, there is a country song. It is called Cactus, <laughs> Gun Smoke, and Hominy. Do you not think that's a country song? <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> Heck, just gun smoke and harmony. I'm telling you right. And I'm not saying harmony dropping my R's like loose buttons. It's harmony, harmony like harmony. corn, you know. <laughs> corn harmony. Yeah, I just thought that was hilarious. That's one of my favorite lines, too. I'm glad you like it. You're the only person that's ever quoted that line. I love it. <laughs> uh, well, if there's a no country favorites. song that comes out of that, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Simon is just so exasperated to to be in in such a, an awful situation with these stupid people stuck in a regimental tent, having to eat cornbread and beans, waiting for people to attack that never attack, and um, and and he's just fed to the gills with it all. He's a very impatient guy. He's a smart guy. He, he's just impatient. Yeah, so that was just that that was the limit. He just hit these limits. We have a lot of people who attend this who are authors or, or want to be authors or who are just fascinated with the author's process. So I'd like to share, I'd like to ask you some questions about your process. Um, and I think I already know the answer to this one. The, the question I ask them all, are you a pantster or a plotter? Meaning, do you plot out what's gonna happen or do you fly by the seat of your pants when you write your, your books? Mainly I'm a pantster on the book that I'm working on now, I'm all, I'm always looking to try new forms. I, I like. Uh, I wrote a dystopian novel about a, a, a dystopia, which I found fun to do. I, I, the novel was not particularly successful, but it was fun to try. So um, what I'm trying now is is a kind of murder mystery, detective story, and it, and it's very plotty. So, uh, but I just want to do it to see if I could do it. Um, but ma mainly, I'm a pantser. Yeah. All right. And so do you set aside a, per, a certain period of time of day when you write? God, I wish. <laughs> I wish. Uh, I would like to, but um, I can't always do that. Yeah. So do you, where do you get your ideas? From Peoria. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's the phone number? I'm going to call them now. <laughs> they come, they come every week in a brown paper package. <laughs> Um, well, one novel has it just devolves into another, and so mainly, I guess I would say, like this time, there's a there was an actual murder in um, southern Missouri, where I come from, close to the French settlements, um, south of St. Louis, which is never solved, and I don't know why it wasn't solved, and it was an entire family, including your old baby, that was murdered, and it's been very, very hard to find any facts on this um, situation. So I have, I have made that the basis for. I thought, oh man, I'll write a murder mystery. I've never written one before, and that's a perfect. And that has bothered me for years and years. Um, so I'll, I'll do something with it. I'll make a story. How long does it take you to write a book? It depends on what else is going on in my life. Um, about two years. Yes. And this one, this book has been really interesting because I've been having to research uh, that old dialectical French, which is somewhere between Cajun French and Quebec French, and it's nothing like Parisian French, and that's been fun. Oh, yeah. Um, so another thing that writers often have to deal with is rejection. And before you became a huge darling of the world with your book, um, The Enemy Woman, you were rejected. Enemy Woman. Uh, yeah, you were uh, you were rejected like fifteen times. Were yeah. you ready to throw in the towel? I mean, were you done? Yeah, I did. I I I, I knew it was a good book. I mean, I knew perfectly well, and it was unusual. It was something new. 
um, women being thrown in prison during the Civil War. It was a, it was a new fact, um, a new take on the Civil War, and I knew it was well written. Um, and for it to be rejected 15, I think it was 17 times, but my agent Liz Darn saw says it was 14. Um, but I finally, I said, Liz, just stop, just stop sending it out. I'm, I'm just going to start another book. I'm going to put it away. I'm going to file it, you know, down in a trunk and I'm going to start another book. And she said, yeah, it's the best thing to do. Or just do something else. Because this is, she, she was upset about it herself. <clears throat> but it just takes that but one. Then it just wow. took Jennifer Brawl, my wonderful editor at HarperCollins, been my editor now for 20 years and more. And, and she said, this is incredible. I love this book. She knocked herself out for that book. She personally wrapped them up in beautiful packages with the bright yellow ribbons and took them to bookstores all through New York. She walked every bookstore. Yeah, she believed in it that much. So I, I was just really fortunate. Did you always know you wanted to write? Yes. It, it, and you started with poetry, which, you know, and then moved into memoirs and then into novels. You've never gone back, have you, to poetry? No, poetry doesn't take up that much time, um, which is probably why I wrote poetry for it first. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and novels take up a long, long, long time. And it took me a long time to learn how to write a novel because I was looking at novels other people around me were writing and they were all about relationships. And I, you know, about white, urban, upper middle class people and their relationships and how they don't work, which is fine, which is fine. You can make a great book out of that. Iris Murdoch made terrific books out of that. And so is Margaret Atwood. Uh, but I didn't want to write that book. And so I wanted to write something else. And I didn't quite know what it was because I really didn't understand the, the power of folk tales at the time. And I wanted to write about action. I wanted to write about people doing things, about things happening from the outside and hitting them and, and how they react as a coward, as a hero, as somebody who's brave, somebody who's compassionate, uh, dealing with outside events like a war or a comet dragon to earth, whatever. Um, that's what I wanted to do, and I didn't know how to do it. I didn't, I didn't even know how to start. So it took me about five years to, and that's a lot of time to waste. That's a lot of time to waste. All right, we're gonna turn to questions and answers. We have a lot of them here. A lot of them, yeah. you, you know, um, uh, oh, Lee Child once said that he was happy that uh, Jack Reacher went to the films, even though the character, which was not, it was Tom Cruise, was not what his character was in the book, because it brought his book to a new world through the movies. And I think that's what's going to happen with your books, is people who are not familiar with you will see news of the world and all of a sudden say, say, I want to read that book and read her other Good. books. So the, the question comes, so we have several in the movie vein. The first one is from Sharon Westafer, who says, how do you feel about the movie adaptation of News of the World? What did you think of it? I think it was very well done. Um, a, a movie and a book are two different things. One is a visual medium and one is totally language, absolutely and totally language. Um, so they're naturally going to be very different. Uh, I knew it was going to be different, and, uh, but it was well done. It was beautifully done. Is there any chance, so this one comes from Mary Denley, is there any chance of a movie for the cover, A Color of Lightning? That is one of my favorite books of all time, and it seems like now would be a good time for a film version of this very important story. Thank you, thank you. I like that book a lot myself, too. It's, it's tragic. It's a tragedy. Um, and it's a true story. My agent in Hollywood, um, Lynn Pochette, is dealing with a Dutch and English consortium writing producing group that they think they're going to make a TV series out of it. We'll see. We'll see. This is several months ago. She seemed to feel that the deal was done, but I have not heard from her on what's happening. But that may happen as the television series. Well, we tended to think, I, uh, you know, that. The Western was over with, it was old school, whatever. And then all of a sudden you had 
um, I can't think of the name of it now, but you know, some of the, the sheriff that, that became a TV show. And so it's like, hmm, maybe that interest in Westerns, and I call this a Western, even though it's not particularly, it's, it's, it's post-Civil War. Um, but I also had read that often after times like the Depression, that's when Westerns came to their height, was because that was that good versus evil that we could hold on to after having dealt with what we did with the hard times. And here after coming out of the pandemic, this may be the time that your books really speak uh, to the world. Well, I was, I was thinking about Westerns, like what, what, what makes Westerns Westerns and why aren't there Easterns or whatever. But um, I, I think it's a very populist medium because you'll notice that all the characters in quote unquote Westerns are not wealthy. Um, they're not wealthy or influential people. They're ordinary people. A cowboy is just a working guy, you know? He's somebody who's just, who's just got a hard physical job. So, but yet he's become an icon um, of the ordinary guy who does extraordinary things. So yes. I, I think it's a very populist medium. And that, and that comes and goes, you know, same anywhere, any literature, any time. Uh, for a long time in England, uh, the most popular literature were about princes and kings and queens and, you know, dramatic, you know, Macbeth and Hamlet and so on. That's what people wanted to see. Um, and, and that fashion, but the, the, the pendul pendulum swings is what I'm right. saying. Yeah, yeah. All right, and then uh, Susan DeLand says, I worked with ethnomusicologist Alan Lomax back in the 1970s. Oh, when oh he my goodness. Trace... Yeah, so that's her question to you. He was tracing and documenting Appalachian music. Was he a work resource for you? No, no, I, I was raised with it. I, I didn't need to. Um, no, I, I, all I had to do was go to YouTube and, and some of the old tunes came back. And, uh, so, oh, that's absolutely wonderful. What is this person's name? Tell me again. Oh, uh, you, the person who asked the question or the, the musicologist? No, the person who asked the question. Susan DeLand, D-E-L-A-N-D. -E yeah. Well, Susan, congratulations for having worked with such a splendid man. Good for you. You're lucky. All right, so um, I'm gonna ask you now because I find this extraordinarily fascinating. In the 70s, you worked in Canada up in the Northern part of Ontario and in the Arctic area there to bring low power radio stations to the indigenous people there. You lived on the reservation. Talk about that time. They're called reserves in Canada. I'm sorry. They're called a reserve a reservation. Um, well, uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation uh, started that project and they knew that the North and the indigenous people, the native people up there were gonna get inundated with English language television and, and radio. And uh, of course, people were very concerned that, that people uh, were able to retain their native language and not get swamped by this. And so the, they figured out uh, the solution was to set up one watt FM radio stations in these villages. Uh, a one watt FM radio station has a, has a radius, broadcast radius about a mile. And uh, to teach people to use them and use them for community purposes like I don't know, do you have the nurses come in and talk about, you know, uh, tuberculosis prevention and have the chief come in and talk about some of the regulations and have uh, the young people come in and sing and play guitar or whatever. And so it was a matter of, of going in and uh, I was, my job, we, we went in in teams and my job was to teach people to use the, the, um, the board, the dashboard. Uh, which I was familiar with because I had been doing uh, one hour documentary, radio documentaries for a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation while I was in Toronto. Because um, I'm bilingual, French and, and English. Not so bilingual now, but I was at the time. So I, it was the greatest time of my life. It was wonderful. We flew up into these extremely remote villages on old beat up uh, bush planes and uh, started setting them up and I started working with people and uh, it, it was just an absolutely wonderful time. And it was very, very cold, but it was just absolutely, I mean, I made friends for life. We still email each other, this is 40 years ago. 
and you actually learned some Ojibwe. Uh, I did. I did. I did. Uh, I never got fluent in it. It's incredibly complex. It's very, very, very complex, and I was never really fluent in it. I, I, I managed to cripple along. Um, I didn't know to shop a mini quick, and that means the dog is drinking the milk. That was the first complete sentence I ever said in my life. I spilled, I spilled a can of carnation milk, and and, and a dog walked in and began to drink it. And I, and I said it, and everybody, isn't she cute? Because <laughs> I talk like a five-year-old, basically. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, I studied the language. I found, it, I find language is fascinating, and so I spent a lot of time. What did you take from your time of actually living on the reserve? That oh, the universality of village life, universality of stories. Because the old people would go on radio and tell myths and legends, or when they were just, you know, I got invited to come into a cabin when people were sitting around drinking tea and uh, some of you start to tell a legend. I couldn't understand them perfectly, but my dear friend, Jim Morris, uh, who is very fluent. I mean, he, he's Ojibwe, and, and, but he also had a college education. He's one of these people you call a culture broker. He was wonderful, and still is, still is. Uh, and he would translate kind of in an undertone for me. And, and the universality of myth and legend and story, and to run into it in this incredibly remote place and these wonderful people. Um, and these guys would tell these stories that would be so complicated. They would tell you every detail. And if, and if a guy called Ayash, who was a hero, uh, was cutting his meat, with a, they would tell you to cut it with a flint knife, and he would tell you that he cut it in very small squares. Uh, every, the details were incredible. So it was a good time. You have had a lot of unusual experiences and even now you live on a, a ranchito you have a donkey you go riding i mean and then you write um you know that you've got a lot of great experiences that you infuse into your books uh and 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 we're we're thrilled with all of that it's just in case anyone is wondering uh simon the fiddler is available in paperback now if you are looking to purchase it there is a link in the chat box there now if you uh, bought a general admission ticket to this you can use that five dollars as a coupon if you will towards any book that paulette giles has written that's in the back order that they have there at creating conversations so that means um, you know, the uh, enemy woman, it means um, the news of the world, it means um, color of lightning, the color of lightning, Lighthouse Island. Um, and is my karma cola in there? I, 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 I'm serious. Uh, I gee, that. it should be. It should I, be. I want that book. So you do, I, I have a bunch of copies stacked up in the garage. If you will email me your physical address, I will send you a copy. I love oh, detective novels, and that's why I'm thrilled that you're going to be writing a murder mystery coming up. You know, it's almost like authors sometimes have to challenge themselves. You know, yeah. uh, it's like, okay, yeah. I've written sci-fi. Hmm, yeah. can I write? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's plotty, and I'm not used to very strict, rigid plots, you know, and I am going out and plotting it ahead of time, so. Well, I'm not yeah. even telling my agent the ending. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can tell us. You could. Ha you have to have a snapper ending for these murder mysteries. Are there any other questions that the people are sending in? You know, not right now. We've we've pretty much covered them, and I think it's because you have been so wonderful with your answers. You've covered so many things. Oh, thank you. You're but, you're a great interviewer. You interview very well. You're thank you. I, I I'm always excited. Let me tell you this: literary women always brings the most incredible authors to their events and to these, these virtual events. It's always a thrill to do the research on the author and go, ooh, I'm gonna dig into this like an archeologist. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I can and imagine. Like you go down the rabbit holes of the history stuff. That's what I do with these guests and, and literary women, I can't speak highly enough of them. And also of Terry Gillum, Gilman, who is the one who puts this all together to make sure we get the books and everything. So I wanna say a big thank you to Creating Conversations and you can find out more about them at creatingconversations.org. You can find out more about literary women at literarywomen.org. Paulette has a uh, blog, but she's 
she's not writing on it anymore, but you can read all her old stuff. And that's paulettegiles.com. So you can go there and, and you can see, uh, you know, her stories and when she was writing them, what she was thinking and, you know, when they were coming out. So go check out the, uh, the stuff for that. So I want to say that. And, and, you know, obviously, finally, the question I want to ask you is, will you come back sometime? I would be happy to. You guys are great. You guys are great. I love people who love books. Well, for sure, this entire group does. All right, so to get the books, to get the eBooks, to get the audiobooks, get that down in the chat. And a reminder, I'm gonna tell a sneaky thing, Barbara, and I hope you don't get mad at me, but we are working on something really exciting for July 20th. We can't tell you everything about it because it hasn't been 100% nailed down yet, but please put a save the date on your calendar for July the 20th, because we're working on something just like we've got Paulette, we got somebody, somebody else that we're working on. Barbara, did you want to say anything? I do. I want to say thank you, Paulette, for taking time to be with us. We're very honored. Yeah, and Pam, we love you. You make our events together perfect. So thank you both. Thank you, Paulette. And I'm yeah. so glad that you were able to spend time with us. Thanks for having me, guys. You're wonderful. Thank you.